This is lecture number three for chapter 13, Apes Water Resources. Um, what I'd like to talk about today are water shortages and then also how we can increase water supply through the um, construction of dams. So water shortages, um, um, some of the things that contribute to water shortages definitely include location and as a result the climate um, in that area like Sub-Saharan Africa for example. Um, there's a lot of people that live in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's an arid area and so there's lots of people that need water and so that kind of um, exacerbates the issue of water shortages there. Um, so some of the things that contribute to it and make it even worse are a dry climate, going through a drought, desiccation, which is the drying of soil as you can see pictured here. Um, and it's a couple of things that lead to desiccation are deforestation and overgrazing. These two processes or methods of using resources are unsustainable and they help contribute to um, desiccation, which is the drying of soil. Um, also, water stress. Um, when there's more stress on water supplies, meaning there's more of a demand, then there's going to be an increase in the likelihood of water shortages. Uh, we can increase water availability by building dams, which I'll cover in the next couple of slides. And with dams, what it does is it uh, stores water. So what we do is essentially we slow down the flow of a river by creating a wall of cement. And behind that wall is what we call a reservoir, or upstream of that wall is a reservoir. So that reservoir floods the surrounding area. And what we can do is uh, draw water out of that reservoir. Um, we could also bring surface water in from other areas. There was um, an issue uh, with the Great Lakes uh, probably about three or four years ago where um, they actually thought about diverting the water in the Great Lakes to the west in the United States. And that definitely was voted down, which is great because that would have impacted not only our natural environment in the Great Lakes, but also economically, it would be a huge hit. Also withdrawing groundwater is a, is a way to increase water availability. Um, the technology of desalinization plants by desalinizing water, taking the salt out of the water. One of the issues with desalination plants is that they're very costly. Um, the technology isn't there yet regarding the ability of it to withstand the corrosiveness of salt water. The infrastructure of desalination plants um, corrodes as a result of all of the dissolved minerals and salts that are in the water. It corrodes the infrastructure, so it costs a lot of money. And essentially, really, just in increasing or improving efficiency in water use. And one simple thing that you could do at home is literally putting a dam in your toilet tank. By a dam, I mean by putting something in the tank that won't um, break the tank. <laughs> we don't want that to happen. But something to displace water in it. So something as simple as a brick, by putting that into the toilet tank, it will displace water. And by displacing water, then you're using less water every time you flush. So that's a very simple thing to do. Um, for dams, we need to look at the cons associated with them. First of all, the pros. Everybody should know um, a pro economically is that it provides jobs. Okay, It provides water for agriculture, or not it, but a reservoir that is a result of building a dam does that. Um, pros environmentally, uh, what you have now is a standing body of water which maybe some migratory waterfowl might um, perceive as a lake and so they would possibly stop over in such an area for rest and for feeding. So um, the migratory waterfowl might be an endangered species um, and so you know there's that. Um, a pro, another pro economically is that it can increase tourism you know I already told you about jobs. So let's look at the cons. Um, one of the biggest things that's totally obvious is the fact that it disrupts or interrupts natural cycles. So here is a picture of a dam here, um, but in 1987 this was the flow of this river. 
Remember, when a river flows, it meanders. It has turns in it. The more meanders or turns you have in a river, generally speaking, the older the river is, meaning that it's had time to carve out the landscape. So this here is the natural flow. And if you remember with um, river systems, when, when a river flows and it turns at the meander, the part on the outside here is the area of erosion because the, the water is moving at a greater velocity in that area. And then the area on the inside of the curve is the area of deposition, which would be here. And in that area, what you would find is shallower water, possibly even like land, uh, with possibly some succession going on. And so that kind of creates a diverse habitat. The water continues to flow this way. Again, the same type of thing can happen. Area of erosion, area of a deposition. So it's this natural cycle. Um, uh, fish and, and frogs and birds are free to move about in this river system. Um, they can migrate upstream, okay? Um, and lay eggs, especially for fish species. A lot of fish species need those feeder streams that feed into the main river system. And they have specific needs as far as benthic habitat to successfully be uh, reproduced successfully. So that's an issue um, that's important. Another thing that rivers are, they're pretty much a nutrient pool or a nutrient um, river, meaning that they're just a river of nutrients where it's just carrying nutrients from one area to another and um, depositing those nutrients, especially along the floodplains of the river, uh, which really helps out with surrounding ecosystems. When it floods, then what happens is it'll leave behind little pools in the riparian zone or floodplain of the river. And those little pools of water are what we call vernal pools. And those are seasonal wetlands. Um, and those are very important habitat, especially for amphibians and um, waterfowl. So, you know, there's a lot of um, dynamics in river systems that are the driving force behind ecosystem diversity and therefore biodiversity. Um, so what a dam does, as you can see here, now this dam has been built and you can even see by the landscape that there's been more um, development uh, because this used to all be green um, and now it's all gray. So obviously then this has been colonized or developed and what we have this is where the river is right here, I believe. Um, all of this area now has been flooded. So now all of that land and even the biomass that was in that land is, or on the land that was alive is now flooded. So what we're doing is we're changing a lotic body of water into a lentic body of water. Um, lentic is a little extreme because the water is still flowing through but at a much uh, slower rate. Um, and, uh, but the force uh, through which the water flows is great. Um, so jumping back here, this area here is what we call a reservoir. This is the area that is upstream of the actual dam. This is the area that's flooded. This reservoir is now home to um, deeper water. It's, it's deep water. We also have, and you need to write this stuff down, um, we have biomass under that water. And that biomass isn't just going to remain as is. It's actually going to be decomposed. And since we have a high biomass or high biological oxygen demand, BOD, we therefore will, could then conclude that the dissolved oxygen levels in this area would drop drastically because of that high BOD. So aerobic bacteria will start decomposing all of that biomass that's been flooded in the reservoir therefore decreasing dissolved oxygen, therefore decreasing the quality of the water. Um, because DO is kind of like the governing, um, one of the governing abiotic factors in water quality, you know, as well as pH. So there's that issue. Another issue is that you're changing it from a lotic to a lentic body of water. So now the organisms that live here are all, I don't want to say confused but they are subjected to an environment that is much different from what they have been evolved that what they've evolved in. So as a result that adds a stressor, yet another variable that will affect the outcome of their survival. The reservoir also tends to trap sediments. So then sediments start to get trapped in here. 
And as a result, the reservoir starts to become shallower because of those sediments building up behind it. Um, this also affects the migration of fish. So if here is a fish here and he wants to swim upstream and he needs to get way up here to this beautiful feeder stream, um, primary uh, water shed, primary headwater shed, um, he can't get there. She can't get there. So as a result, um, the dam is an obstacle for the success of that species reproducing. Um, also, another interesting thing, since we're changing this reservoir, since this reservoir has been changed to this lentic habitat, we actually start to see signs of uh, thermal stratification, um, not only in the summer, but also in the winter. And so you get, you know, your um, epilimnion, and then you get your hypolimnion, and you get a thermocline. So you start to see those um, lim limnology um, type of characteristics, water characteristics, uh, that we would normally see in a lake, we start to see in the reservoir. And those are changing conditions. And if you remember, the thermocline is that, that um, area of water where you see a drastic drop in temperature. So the epilimnion is warmer and the hypolimnion is cooler. And where there's that sudden drop, um, it kind of creates like a cap, uh, not allowing the primary productivity oxygen byproduct of photosynthesis in the epilimnion to get to the hypolimnion. Okay, so all those things I just said, I hope you guys wrote down, but what's wonderful about this is you can listen to this again. You need to understand the dynamics of this in depth like I just went over. Um, and then one last thing about the cons is erosion. I talked about the velocity of the water coming through here. Right here, uh, downstream from the reservoir, the water comes out really fast. And as a result, it scours this benthic bottom of the river downstream. So that scouring is uh, a huge issue because that creates a lot of erosion. And then those sediments are sent downstream. One other thing is that the floodplains that are downstream of the dam will no longer receive the nutrient load that they once did as a result of the water uh, flowing through freely. So this water no longer is flowing through freely and as a result, the nutrient deposition is, has decreased. So the surrounding riparian zones and floodplains of the river downstream will suffer uh, nutrient loss as a result. So here is just another picture of a dam, just to give you another view. So this is the reservoir. This is upstream. The water is flowing this way. This is downstream. And you can see that it just really scours uh, the bottom here and the sides. Um, as the water comes through here. Okay, um, again, some, some dynamics about the reservoir is that it becomes a lentic environment and then all of the abiotic factors associated with that regarding water quality. We talked in the previous slide about um, the, um, the biomass that is now flooded underneath in the reservoir and that's basically a high BOD that's going to increase um, the BOD, which will decrease the DO because the aerobic bacteria will be decomposing all of those trees that are under the water, uh, any of the grass, any of the other plant matter, it's getting decomposed. So DO drops. Another thing is sediments build up behind here because uh, rivers are essentially um, a flowing body of water but it's not just water, it's also sediments and nutrients. So the sediments get trapped back here, the nutrients get trapped back here, and as a result, you have reduced sediment load and deposition downstream, and you also have reduced nutrients downstream. And one other thing to add to this, since I said that the uh, nutrients get trapped, then you all know what can happen there. Um, eutrophication, in this case, it would be cultural eutrophication because um, it is uh, an anthropogenic source of eutrophying this system, okay? So remember eutrophication, um, high nutrients, because the nutrients are getting trapped back here, leads to increase in algae. So we have a higher phytoplankton count. Um, phytoplankton will die and it will fall to the bottom. And then what you have then is additional uh, biomass for the aerobic decomposers to decompose as a result, dropping dissolved oxygen levels, okay? So that's the end of lecture three.